All right, welcome to our next talk. We've actually got a presentation here on attacking medical devices by a presenter that's so elite he actually has it in his name. Please welcome Rob Provleet to the Turacon stage. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, so, yeah, talk is on uh, attacking medical devices. Um, my name is Rob Portfleet. I'm the uh, director of Red Team Services at Silence. Um, prior to that, I was NetSec lead at Foundstone, yada, yada. Um, favorite things include um, uh, breaking embedded systems. Uh, I did some wireless research and, uh, of course, red teaming. Um, so we do a fair amount of medical device uh, assessments for both uh, providers, that being uh, you know hospitals, et cetera, uh, and uh, for uh, medical device vendors. Um, so I figured this would be a good topic for a talk, as um, you know we've uh, we've done some interesting testing and we've found uh, you know a number of interesting vulnerabilities over time. Uh, a lot of stuff, I guess, which you could, could consider uh, systemic, right? Um, and we'll talk about those later in the talk. But um, I figured it would be good to do a talk on this to kind of you know get it out there that you know there's a lot of issues with medical devices as there are with all embedded systems, right? Or most embedded systems, uh, and you know uh, kind of get some of the techniques out there that we've been using to assess these so that other folks, um, you know, either if you work for a provider or a vendor or you're just doing this on your own time, um, that can kind of, you know, move the ball forward. Can everybody hear me all right? All right, cool. All right, I've never been accused of being too quiet. Um, so anyway, we're going to do a you know, quick intro to medical devices, um, talk a little bit about some of the tools that you can use uh, for assessing them, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the attack techniques that we use, how we you know, basically conduct an assessment, um, some of the vulnerabilities that we found, and you know, some recommendations for, um, you know, for fixing that. Right. All right, so uh, you know, one of the interesting things about medical devices is that they take so many different forms. Um, you know, what you consider, can consider as a medical device, most people might just think of an embedded system, um, but it, it is those, and it could be everything up to, everything from you know, what we have there, like a, uh, uh, an implanted cardioverter, right? Small uh, embedded device, probably uses an RTOS or similar, um, you know, or a uh, medical telemetry device. It's a wearable, it transmits uh, wirelessly, right? Also, generally, like an RTS, a small embedded device. Uh, but then you have, you know, uh, large devices like mobile x-ray systems that would use a full-featured Linux OS, um, sometimes a custom Linux uh, OS developed by the, uh, by the vendor, um, all the way up to um, you know, basically what you'd consider just a, a Windows PC or some sort of Windows PC on a cart that you generally see with, like, exercise or stress testing systems, right? Uh, also considered medical devices are things like web applications, uh, those as well, uh, as developed by, uh, by vendors, right? So it means many different things, and they take many different forms, and also communicate in many different ways. Um, so we have a lot of different interfaces, right? Uh, and this is, you know, just a change from a number of years ago where, you know, most, like, for instance, infusion pumps would just have, like, RS-232 serial, right? Uh, and I just looked at a bunch recently that were... Uh, devices, you know, in existence already that had been out for a while, and you know that's primarily what you saw um, was you know RS-232 serial interfaces, if anything, right? So there's not a ton of external uh, external attack service there, um, but over the last number of years, that's branched out significantly, and this is mostly due to a demand for functionality, right? And as as functionality increases, uh, so does attack surface, right? So you have, you know, Ethernet, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth and Bluetooth LE, different kinds of cellular, um, RFID in, in terms of uh, magnetic induction, uh, and of course, you know, Zigbee, um, USB, obviously, and also wireless USB we've seen. Uh, and then, of course, there is all the proprietary stuff. Um, proprietary wireless protocols um, and implementations are very common uh, in various medical devices, such as uh, implantables, uh, wearables, or, or body-worn devices, and uh, also um, patient telemetry devices. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So kind of the challenge there, and one of the, 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 um, the fun parts about it, though, is that there's so many different types of interfaces uh, and protocols, technologies in use that the uh, you know the uh, attack techniques are so varied, right? You get to do a lot of different stuff on one engagement, um, but it also makes it challenging. 
So medical device connectivity, real quick. Um, these are two of the more common protocols that you run into. Um, HL7 is uh, very common. Uh, it's a standard for communicating between disparate and varied medical systems. Um, the most common versions of that you'll probably encounter are V2 and V3. Uh, V2 is very, uh, uh, very recognizable when you see it. Uh, all the fields are delimited with different like pipes or carrots, uh, at various symbols. Uh, when you see it, it, it it's very um, recognizable. V3 is more XML based. Um, both do not have built-in encryption, uh, where it's, it's uh, uh, I guess you could say, um, incumbent around you to uh, secure it in some other fashion uh, as, as a vendor, right? Uh, like wrapping it in TLS or some other uh, protective uh, tunnel. Uh, DICOM is a standard for uh, storing, uh, transmitting and storing medical images, uh, generally between like some kind of um, imaging uh, device and uh, like a PACS server or PACS database. It does have built-in uh, encryption and other security measures. Uh, however, you don't see them implemented as much as you would hope. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later as well. Uh, okay, so... Um, Medical bands, as defined by the FCC. Um, two main ones here, we have uh, WMTS, or Wireless Medical Telemetry Service, right? That is for um, devices, telemetry devices worn on the body by a patient that would transmit vitals data wirelessly. Um, and that is in two main bands there. The, the second of the, th uh, if you see three, the, the second of the two are considered what you'd consider the 1.4 gigahertz band. Um, the, uh, the other is uh, med radio, and uh, the first there, med radio, is for um, body-worn devices, but also implantables. Um, the, uh, the two below that are, are uh, what you call purpose-specific bands. Um, the medical body uh, area networks uh, is for uh, implantable devices only, and the uh, MMMs, or medical micropower networks, are actually for wireless devices used for... Um, uh, bringing mobility or helping to bring mobility to paralyzed limbs, and that's its specific purpose, those specific bands. Uh, these are defined by the FCC as carved out uh, airwave space, but the protocols, there are no standard for protocols to be used in them. That is vendor specific, and you see all kinds of different proprietary implementations uh, in terms of protocols. All right, so a little bit about tool sets. So uh, on the network side, um, I recommend a, a good portable switch with a span port. That dual com switch is about $170, um, which is a little pricey for a portable switch, but I've had really good luck with it. I've never given me any problems. This is really useful for when you uh, want to monitor Ethernet communication between two systems, uh, you know, a patient monitor or an infusion pump and the system that is uh, sending and receiving data from. Um, so very useful there. Um, Software-defined radio, so as I just mentioned, right, you have uh, these defined, you know, WMTS and med radio bands, but your uh, protocol communications in there could be anything the vendor defines, and you see all kinds of interesting stuff in there. Um, so in that case, your, your best bet is to use uh, SDR. I use a USRP B200, uh, and that it's very effective for that. Also, if you have to deal with, for instance, GSM, that's useful as well. Um, if you're going to use it with GSM, you also need a GPS do clock, uh, dough clock tamer chip, which is about an additional $600 or so um, because of GSM's clock sensitivity, but um, I digress. Um, a good wireless card, I use the AWS uh, 51NH, um, you know, whatever you like, um, as long as it can do uh, monitor mode and injection, it's golden. Um, the AVR Ravens, that's for Zigbee, so if you encounter or are assessing a device that uh, utilizes Zigbee, uh, I recommend these devices. They work best with the Killer Bee framework. Uh, I would recommend two, one for doing injection and then the other for monitoring while you're doing injection and those sort of attacks. They're cheap. Um, the only bummer about them is you're going to have to flash the firmware on them. Um, there's a couple different techniques for doing that. The cheapest one is to use an Atmel AVR Dragon, which is like 40 bucks, and uh, a few different adapters, step up and step down adapters to make it work. But that's like the cheapest route to go. So you don't have to buy like a $170 programmer. Um, Ubertooth One for Bluetooth, Bluetooth LE, awesome, passive monitoring. Um, best tool for that and definitely essential for doing any kind of Bluetooth work. 
And then uh, I recommend a good class one Bluetooth adapter. Class one's the strongest Bluetooth adapter class. It's usually uh, on paper good for 100, I believe 100 yards. Um, in practice, maybe not quite that, but uh, you know, you want a powerful uh, adapter. I recommend the uh, Cena Perani. I've been using that for years. Um, the latest revision of it supports both Bluetooth and Bluetooth LE, so that would be what I would go with. Again, your mileage may vary. Um, hardware. So on the hardware side of assessment is obviously where you're going to be end up spending the most money or having the most devices. Uh, hardware tends to multiply devices like rabbits. Um, some sort of uh, all-purpose um, uh, bus and a debug interface um, device. Uh, I like the Shikra. You, uh, the bus pirate is also good, but I found the uh, the Shikra to be a bit better. Um, just as long as you can do JTAG, SPI, UART, maybe I2C. Uh, a uh, universal IC programmer is, is great, um, only because uh, the number of chips that they support, if you're trying to dump the firmware or contents of a flash chip, uh, you don't have to mess around with uh, with different tooling. Uh, you know, this thing does like the the uh, Zeltec, the Super Pro with 610 does like 30,000 different kinds of chips. It's like 600 bucks, so it's expensive, relatively speaking, but it gets the job done. Um, a logic analyzer. The Salier stuff is great. The Logic 16 I recommend because it's very fast and has a big buffer space for doing captures off of, uh, you know, as like SPI and et cetera. Um, you could probably get away with the Logic 4 or the Logic 8, which are cheaper. Um, not quite as fast or powerful as full featured, um, but they get the, you know, all their, all their stuff is actually really good. Um, I also recommend some kind of dedicated uh, or professional JTAG or and uh, is, uh, serial wire debug uh, probe like a Sager. Um, only because, again, you know, when you're doing hardware stuff and things are not working, you would like to have something that you know is is definitely, you know, is rock solid. Um, so you're not doing so much guesswork. You can get the student version of this for about 60 bucks, um, and it's definitely good to have on hand. Uh, JTAGulator, good for one purpose only, and it's awesome at that, and that is uh, pinning out JTAG and UART um, at a high rate of speed. Um, it does an awesome job for that. So if you're trying to pin out your JTAG uh, or UART ports when you're doing hardware assessment, awesome for that. Um, particularly good when, um, for instance, you can't do it with a multimeter because the chips in question are um, you know, like ball grid array or what have you, and you can't, or the real steep pitch pins, you can't reach it. Uh, a good multimeter, invaluable for pinning stuff out. Um, if you're like me and your eyes are crap, a good bench magnifier or USB microscope, um, at least a bench magnifier so that you can see um, the hardware that you're working on. You can read chip markings, you can look at pins and uh, hook stuff up um, without guessing at it uh, or messing things up. Um, particularly also really invaluable if you're like me and you have fat fingers. Um, a good soldering station is awesome for uh, you know attaching headers and other stuff. Um, in the medical device space, if you're assessing for um, providers, they may not want you soldering stuff onto it. Um, you know, m making hardware modifications is somewhat frowned upon. For vendors, less, because they have stuff in the lab, so they don't really care so much. Um, but the Hakko stuff is always awesome, and that one, I believe, is like not under $100. Uh, and then various jumper wires, uh, resistor, uh, step-up, step-down resistor kits, headers, test clips, and this stuff will multiply on you really quickly. Okay, so assessing and attacking. All right. Beep. All right. I was looking at the time a little bit. Um, all right, so some testing considerations real quick. Uh, if you're assessing for uh, a provider, that being a, a hospital, right, uh, the device should be a test, uh, test device in a lab, a dedicated test device. It should not go back into, you should never test, number one, in production. Duh. Uh, number two, it should never go back into production after it's been tested on because you've done all kinds of horrible stuff to it. Um, it nobody, you should, you know, it, it's a safety critical system. It should not be used, relied upon for, you know, patient safety after what you horrible things you've done to it. 
Um, the device, when you're testing it, should be configured for normal operation. That being that it has all its supporting systems. It, uh, you're using like a patient vitals generator or some other demo uh, to uh, to basically uh, generate normal traffic and operation between the device and its supporting systems. Uh, if you're assessing for a provider, right, they have SMEs that can help you with this stuff. You know, make sure everything's set up and working as it should be, right? Because Assessing a device in a vacuum won't get you interesting things. Assessing a device communicating as normal with the rest of its ecosystem, right, and its supporting systems will, and that's where you're going. To, you're going to you're going to affect value. You're going to get, you're going to get cool stuff. Uh, of course, all the supporting systems should be in scope. We'll talk about that why in a minute. Um, and the main focus of your testing should really be two things. Number one, anything that impacts patient safety. Okay, uh, anything that will affect the, the, the safety of the patient or the, the integrity of the data being transferred as it relates to the patient's safety or the, uh, uh, the availability of the device as it, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, applies to the patient's safety. Uh, and then, of course, uh, anything that exposes PHI or PII, because that is going to be a big concern for any uh, providers under HIPAA, right? So um, the confidentiality of the uh, patient data as it's stored or transferred by the device is, of course, going to be a big concern. Um, and those would be in that order, patient safety first, PHI, PII second, and then anything else would be tertiary. So kind of a really bad tree here, because I'm no good at creating these things, of like the attack surface, how we look at it, right? Look at the device attack surface, OK? And we look at the hardware attacks as part of that. So that would be the internal device surface, right? So external device surface, all interfaces, uh, all ports, protocols, services, or any other way that you're going to be able to get data into the device in some fashion, data that you control. Hardware attacks, that being internal stuff, debug interfaces, uh, the ability to dump chipsets through like SPI or I2C or anything like that. Uh, protocol reverse engineering, split into two parts, wireless stuff and wired, all right? So wireless protocols and wired protocols. Uh, all supporting systems, this could be vendor supplied servers, workstations, monitoring systems, vendor supplied applications, both uh, thick apps, binaries, right, et cetera, and uh, web applications or APIs or web services, right? Any of that stuff. Um, so those would come off as part of supporting systems. So basically, you know, any supporting su systems or applications supplied by the vendor as well. Um, you know, again, this is one big ecosystem and generally, um, when vendors uh, provide devices, often in the case of let's just say patient monitoring, right, they provide almost the whole ecosystem. There'll be the patient monitors, a central monitoring workstation, um, a uh, back-end database and some kind of gateway there. There actually may be, actually be a firewall included in that to segment it from the, the provider network. Um, and there's a reason for that because anything that hits these devices knocks them over. Uh, and then probably also like some sort of uh, WMTS or wireless medical telemetry system with its wireless APs and everything feeding back into that. So the whole thing is like one ecosystem and it you know, behooves you to really test the whole thing as such um, because that's what the attacker will do. So, um, I'm getting my time again. Okay, um, device discovery, right? First thing you wanna do is take a look at the model number of the device, look up everything you can on it, pull down all the service documentation. Uh, there's a couple different sites like uh, MedWrench and Frank's Hospital Workshop that are centered around medical device repair, and they store all kinds of data sheets and info. Good place to go for that stuff, all right? So you wanna find everything you can there. Um, every device that's, that is sold in the U.S. that has any, uh, any kind of wireless communication will have an FCC ID on it. It'll be a sticker on the device. Take that number, go to FCCID.io, uh, I believe it is, the F just Google FCC ID lookup. Um, and what you can do is you can look that up there. Um, it's a, uh, the first three to five characters will be the grantee code and the rest will be the product code. So the grantee code is actually the vendor. Um, every device, if you just search that, every device they've ever made will come up. If you put in the grantee code as well, um, or the product code, it will show that device only. What you're looking for there is, um, every, uh, when you have a device tested by the, by the FCC, which you must, right, they have a bunch of documentation that they'll keep. will tell you the frequencies the device transmits on, the nature of the transmissions. Um, you get stuff like, uh, internal photos of the device, external photos, um, which are useful if uh, you want to learn more about the device but you're not allowed to take it apart. Um, 
manuals, other kind of mundane stuff. But if you're fortunate and they didn't make a request for confidentiality to the FCC, you'll get stuff like block diagrams of the circuitry, um, schematics, and then really good stuff like operating description, descriptions, which is basically their engineering docs. Um, so you'll get really good stuff there if they were not careful. If you don't see it for the most current device, go back a little ways and see if they dropped it for something previously before they got smart and then never had it removed, because you've seen that before too. Um, the, determine any proprietary protocols that it's utilizing and search for that stuff. Um, look, you know, the vendor probably won't have a lot of doc on it, but if you go to like Google Patents, there may be uh, a fair bit of info about it there if they filed a patent on it, and you may be able to find info elsewhere. Um, the other thing you can do is go out and look for um, parsing tools that have already been written that are out on GitHub or elsewhere that the medical community has, uh, medical device community has, uh, has already created, right? So don't reinvent the wheel. Um, so let's see what else. Um, uh, obviously look for any prior vulns, any prior work, security work that's been done around the device, right? Um, enumerate all the device interfaces, um, and then look for external debug interface, on, uh, debug functionality on the device. Some devices, all devices generally have a service mode, and you can find those hard-coded credentials in those service manu manuals. But some will also have like actual debug functionality. Like I saw a patient monitor once that would actually uh, not only give you uh, debug output on the monitor, but it would also also give you um, stack dumps, stack traces, uh, memory dumps, all kinds of really cool stuff. Um, so get an idea of what you can, what do you have to work with there. Um, and again, hard, by the way, hard-coded credentials everywhere, everywhere, everywhere in medical devices. Uh, and you can find them um, exceptionally easy. Actually, one time it was kind of funny. We, um, we went and um, <laughs> reversed the binary to get some hard-coded creds, and then we realized it was in the manual on uh, Frank's Hospital Workshop. Oopsie. Yeah, that was kind of dumb. Uh, couldn't even write that up in the report as like us being cool because it was like the, the client would have, oh, it's in the manual, you know, dummy. Uh, okay, so supporting systems. I just kind of gave you guys the spiel on this, right? They often come with, with medical, um, vendor supplied servers, and if not, they'll be vendor supplied applications, both thick and thin, right? Um, Look through first, go in the directory, look through the config files. There'll be a wealth of all kinds of interesting stuff in there. Sometimes just plain text creds or encrypted creds where the key is stored in the binary. The binaries, they, more often than not, are .NET. You find a lot of .NET stuff. So if you just use something like DNSpy, uh, DNSpy which is my favorite, um, you can decompile them real quick uh, and it's really easy to look through. So I mean, you know, done. Um, other stuff like database, database connection strings, um, all kinds of interesting stuff. And uh, once you go through the uh, config files, any INI files, CFG, text, anything text, go through it. Um, then look at the binaries. If they're .NET, take them apart immediately. Search for the same thing. Look for anything that says, you know, key, cert, password, username. You know, you look, you will find. You will find lots of. You will find more than you, you can imagine. Um, the other thing that's uh, useful about reversing uh, the server-side binaries is it's generally less resource intensive than pulling apart firmware, um, especially if it's .NET stuff. So if you're going to be doing any proprietary protocol reversing, right, much easier to pull it apart on that side and way faster, right? Uh, you know, generally we only have like a, a, week, a week or two to do one of these devices, um, like a couple weeks if it's hardware. So, you know, time is uh, important in the, in, the, in the scope of the engagement, right? So you want to take the path that, um, you know, that yields the most in the least amount of time, yeah? All right. So protocol reversing, like I said, there's a, every vendor in, in, uh, in medical device world seems to have their own proprietary protocol that they like to use. Um, there are, uh, as I said, parsers for a number of them up on GitHub or elsewhere, so you will find a fair bit of parsers or partial parsers that you might have to add. So you'll have some stuff you might have to add to it as you go. It may, you know, uh, decode certain kinds of packets but not others, right? Um, but anyway, it's a starting point, right? Um, they're often UDP-based. You see this a lot in patient monitors, right? So they're going to be unencrypted. They're UDP-based. They're streaming protocols. Um, they're real easy to to uh, to pull apart, right? Um, and it makes for a lot of like you know, man-in-the-middle attacks, replay attacks, things of that nature. Um, it also makes it pretty easy to identify any PHI or PII being sent across them. Um, 
So uh, the other thing that we'll talk about in a minute is really crappy uh, roll your own encryption being used in that as well. And uh, devices identifying each other through like UDP broadcasts uh, with no, you don't see anything in the way of like mutual authentication between devices. Um, so anyways, I was saying, right, um, okay, so wireless protocols, right? Wireless is a little bit more difficult. The first thing to do is go through the FCC ID lookup process that I was talking about, right? Um, find out what frequency it's utilizing. You can get an idea of what it is more or less there. Um, and then um, another helpful thing to do, if you can take the device apart, take a look at the wireless chipset, figure out what the, look at the markings, download the data sheets, look through that. Um, if you can pull the firmware, pull that. Um, that'll be helpful as well in ascertaining exactly what it is that they're doing. Um, if it's easier to pull the firmware from what it's communicating with, like if it's a telemetry device, it's going to communicate with a wireless telemetry AP. It might be easier or like, well, the device might not have a JTAG interface. The AP might, right? So check out both and which of the e easier, which one of, the, of them is easier to pull apart because they're both going to use the same thing to communicate. Pull that one apart. Save yourself time. Uh, in terms of the actual capture, identify the frequency. Um, use a USRP with like GQRX to um, to ascertain where it is transmitting. Uh, if you control the input on the device, which you should, uh, generate some transmission input so that you can identify. You can. Uh, um, you can take a look at how it is transmitting. Uh, you can use a tool like Osmocom FFT to take a capture of it. Um, once you've captured it, you can use this tool called Spectrum that's really awesome for this. Um, that allows you to uh, do a graphical analysis of uh, the, uh, the captured um, signal. And by doing so, you can identify like what kind of keying is it using, what kind of modulation rather. You know, is it amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, on off keying, right? That should be pretty visually obvious due to their, their distinctions. Uh, and then the, the hard part is using something like GNU, GNU Radio Companion, which has a fairly steep learning curve, um, to um, demodulate, decode, and bring, the, the, uh, bring it back to binary that we can work with, right? Um, there's a new tool out there, a relatively new tool, that I haven't had a chance to use yet, but it actually looks really cool for this. It's called the Universal Radio Hacker. Um, which seems to make, look to uh, look like its aim is to make a lot of this a fair bit easier. So I'm actually looking forward to trying that on an engagement. Um, but this is a fair, you know, this is a very fun but time-consuming process. Um, unless you're like Michael Osman, then it probably takes two seconds. Uh, so hardware discovery. Um, carefully open the device. Um, look for any kind of tamper uh, prevention stuff or tamper detection. I don't really run into anything very exotic. Um, largely just um, springs, uh, different kinds of shields that uh, are attached to the case that if it's broke, the connection is broken, the device won't function. Um, those are really easy to bypass. You can just short between the two. Um, or you can suppress the spring. Or in one case, we found that it, was a, it wasn't a medical device. It was a cheaper device because um, I don't think our medical device clients would have been happy about this one, but um, the shield didn't cover all of the case. In fact, right over the flash chip I was trying to dump was no shield, so I took a Dremel and just cut a hole in it. Um, but again, you know, medical device is a little more expensive. They don't like when you do that kind of thing. Um, Use a bench magnifier or your eye or your phone camera works good for this stuff too. Figure out, look at the uh, uh, the chip markings, write them down, um, write down the markings and look up all the the chip uh, uh, the data sheets for each chip, particularly like the microcontroller, uh, the wireless sock uh, or chipset, um, any flash chips, SPI flash, NOR NAND flash, whatever, any kind of memory chip you want that as well. Those are the most important areas of it. Um, look at those data sheets. And then see what they support. Do they support, what kind of bus protocols do they support? SPI, I2C. Um, does the microcontroller support different kind of debug interfaces? JTAG, UART, background debug mode, serial wire debug, right? Um, and then look at the board and look for uh, debug interfaces, right? So look for any kind of, again, JTAG, UART, et cetera. Um, any test points, any, any pins, uh, headers that are already in place, pads, et cetera, right? So that's what we want to look for. Um, this is just some of the stuff that you get out of out of uh, data sheets, right? Uh, the one on the left, I think, is a, um, a Freescale. The one in the middle there is Atmel um, uh, MCU, uh, and you can just see there the uh, 
different JTAG pins, TMS, TDI, TDL, and uh, that the Freescale, this is where you will usually see background debug mode is in Freescale uh, processors. But anyway, this is the stuff that you'll get out of the data sheets. Um, different debug interfaces, right? JTAG has five pins, uh, sometimes six. Uh, test data in, test data out, test mode select, uh, test clock and ground, sometimes test reset. Serial wire debug actually will generally ride on top of that interface. So on your 20-pin 20, 20 uh, standard ARM JTAG here, um, you can see that the uh, three um, serial wire debug pins actually dual purpose with some of the JTAG pins. And then UART's just three pins, uh, transmit, receive, and, uh, and ground. Uh, connecting the UART, you can do this with a, a Shikra, a Bus Pirate, a, any FD, FTDI friend or any kind of FTDI adapter, um, three pins, uh, any serial terminal will do, so minicom, screen, uh, what have you. Um, all you have to do is specify the device and the speed. Um, so things you'll get out of UART, right, depending on the, what, how what the vendor is done, or their implementation, or what they're sending out of it, rather, it can give you a full root shell. Uh, it could give you like a less privileged shell, like some kind of manufactured menu type shell where you'll have to look for an escape or look to subvert like uh, the, the bootloader to get yourself more privileged access. Um, or just shooting debug output, which is very common. It'll send debug output, which is actually really useful because on startup, when the device starts up, it'll give you the full hardware list of everything and where everything's mounted and everything else, all the addresses. So that's actually really valuable. Um, it's also really good like when you're working with G JTAG and you have like, you're using open OCD and you're trying to set a reset or whatever, you can watch the, uh, the output to make sure the device is actually uh, bouncing when you expect it to, or freezing, freezing when you reset. Sorry, I'm, I want to get to the, uh, well, I'm watching my time here. Uh, I get to be, I get, tend to be a little overly verbose. Um, all right, so some of the ways that you can dump firmware, right? Dumping flash over SPI. This is a uh, SPI flash, uh, a wind bond chip. Uh, it's a, what you'd call a, a, an eight pin SOIC. Um, here, this we can use as a Shikra or Bus Pirate, right? Um, we hook up the uh, Mozzie Miso S Clock Slave Select and Ground pins, and then we can use a tool called Flash ROM. Flash ROM is a great open source tool for um, for dumping uh, or, or programming flash chips. Uh, as long as the chip in question is supported by Flash ROM, you can dump it out to a file and then use a tool like Binwalk to pull it apart, and that'll pull out all the different sections of the file, uh, hopefully. And, uh, and then you'll have a little uh, additional reversing to do from there. Uh, another way to do this is dumping flash via JTAG. Um, this is kind of a weird way we did it here, but it was cool. Um, we used the, the J-Link probe. We found that uh, it had a, a, JTAG, um, a JTAG interface. Um, and uh, what we used was um, uh, uh, Seger provides a free tool toolkit. Um, Along, uh, you can download from their site. Part of that is the JFlash tool. And the JFlash tool will let you write or read to any uh, internal or externally supported flash that it supports. Uh, and that's what we did here, was we used that to dump out the contents of this uh, SD micro flash. Uh, if you see here, this is actually a, uh, I believe this is a NOR flash. Um, it's not an SPI enabled flash. It doesn't just use one one pin for transmitting and receiving data over the bus. It uses multiple and they're quite fast. So the technique we used previously there would not work for this, right? Um, so in this case, you know, using JTAG here, we were able to dump the contents of the, uh, of that flash chip. All right, cool. So we got about 16 minutes left. All right, cool. So, so uh, Volans, yeah. All right. So some of the, this is some of the stuff that we found on engagements. Uh, not naming any vendors or, or uh, any, any particular devices. The, whole, the purpose here is not to name and shame. Um, these were all found on uh, uh, engagements for providers, uh, not for vendors themselves. Um, and at any rate, so a lot of unauthenticated interfaces, okay? Uh, lack of mutual authentication. Um, no message integrity protection, uh, lacks of re lack of replay protection. So this is all protocol related stuff, as well as remote denial of service. Um, we found that you can knock devices over with a stiff breeze. Um, un either unencrypted protocols or really weak encryption schemes and a lot of hard coded credentials and keys. And what I'm gonna do here is give you an example of quite a few of these, not just read this slide. So um, I talked earlier about DICOM. Right, so DICOM is used for transferring images between an imaging device and uh, a back-end database server, like a PAC server, right, uh, which is a picture archiving and communications server, I believe. 
Uh, medical world loves their long, really long acronyms. Um, so anyway, part of what DICOM has on the server side is what's a Q, called a QRSCP service. Um, consider this kind of like a, like a SCP or an FTP, if you will, right? It's an interface that allows you to, well, that's actually probably a bad analogy, but uh, it's an interface that allows you to query the database, and it is not necessarily authenticated. Um, generally, all you require is a AET, an application entity title. So this is a specific. Think of it like an SNMP community name. If you know this word or this, you know this this uh, this string, you can connect up and access and make queries against the database. And all you need to know is what you're querying for. Um, uh, again, as I said, DICOM does have security profiles. They are not often implemented, and di uh, vendors will publish what they call a DICOM conformance statement. And basically, what it's, uh, it shows is its devices, uh, what what DICOM features it device, its their device supports, and it's it's published for the purpose of interoperability between that device and other devices that talk that speak DICOM. All right, but it will tell you the list of their default AET titles. All right. It'll have a big list of those. It'll tell what it, what classes are supported, if it supports any security profiles. And in the case of one vendor, it said specifically that we do not support any, I'm paraphrasing, we don't support any, any DICOM security profiles. It is up to the provider to secure, to place the device in a secure environment. Uh, basically, it's not our problem. So what we are able to do there was we found the uh, open, uh, DICOM uh, QRSCP port. Um, we used PyNet DICOM to connect to it, which is a Python library for communicating over DICOM over the network. And then there's also PyDICOM for viewing what you've gotten, what you've retrieved. Um, we went and downloaded the um, from the U.S. Census data a list of like you know the, the top 1,000 most common surnames or last names, right? Then we basically ran those through a for loop and dumped thousands and thousands of records out of the database by doing that. Because as long as you know what you're, you're querying for, you can pull it out, right? So we just queried for all common last names and pulled out thousands and thousands of, uh, of records, of patient records out of the database. Um, proprietary protocol manipulation. Um, so as I said, pri proprietary protocols, very common. This is in the case of a uh, patient monitoring system. And uh, it was simple UDP-based protocol. Um, what we did was we generated known values on the patient monitor and uh, watched it communicate with the uh, central monitoring system. Uh, we modified those values and observed it again, identified what it, how it was encoding them and where they were in the data packets. Uh, and then we just wrote a simple uh, editor cap filter uh, to modify those. So, for instance, you know, you'd change 80 to 31337 or what have you. Uh, and we were able to reliably change every value that was displayed on the central monitoring workstation uh, from these patient monitors. Uh, the result of it, of course, being that we could, uh, you know, uh, make the, the uh, nurse who's watching the central monitoring station think whatever we thought about, uh, you know, show regular normal uh, values while we're, um, you know, killing the patient or assassinating the patient um, or what have you, right? You know, a little, little Hollywood there, but you see my point. Um, the other thing we found in that same protocol and in for others from other vendors was that device impersonation was possible. And what we found was that um, in the one case, the devices would use the the patient monitors would uh, or they would and the the central monitoring station would send out a, a UDP broadcast saying here I am uh, you know is anybody out there, well as long as you respond with the properly formatted uh, UDP uh, response the device will talk to you and it will actually respond to you with a uh, if you spoof the central monitoring system it will respond to you with the patient data packet uh, containing all the, the patient's information um, before it will start sending you the vitals data right um, this is uh, encrypted very poorly and we'll talk about this in a second but basically uh, it's a very simple key on both devices, um, what we were able to do is decrypt it by just uh, reverse engineering. Uh, we reverse engineered the binaries on the central monitoring workstation to identify how the protocol worked, uh, and those actually shipped with debugging symbols, so that was really much easier. And then to get the key, because uh, we were lazy, we, there was a um, HL7 gateway system that had uh, .NET binaries on it. Um, 
that had the uh, the key for this as well for that uh, that uh, that basically had that uh, that array that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so we were able to pull that out of there. Um, so both ways worked, um, but the the end result was we were able to become a device, a trusted device, um, and have the uh, patient data sent to us. So remote denial of service. Um, uh, this is like kind of goes without saying. Um, a lot of the devices that we've assessed will fall over from a stiff breeze. Um, you don't have to do any kind of elaborate fuzzing. Uh, if you end map them, they will fall over. Which is, by the way, why uh, in terms of you know, like port or vulnerability scanning. Uh, medical devices in a live uh, clinical environment, I strongly advise against it. Uh, when we do pen tests for providers, you know, network pen tests, I always ask them, what, you know, what segments are your medical devices on? Because, uh, you know, we do not want to do any scanning on there because they, do not, they don't like it. They don't handle it well. Uh, just some examples there, right? One, if you sent greater than 361K to the open UDP port, it would fall over immediately and reboot constantly. We, uh, that was actually the one that had the debug. Um, functionality uh, on, the, on the monitor that I was talking about, and I thought that would be so awesome to debug this thing out and find out if we get remote code execution, but we couldn't get it to not reboot as soon as we sent the thing to it. Um, so uh, another WMTS system, you could just hold it offline by catting uh, dev you random into, into Netcat and sending it to an open UDP port. Uh, you could hold it offline indefinitely. Um, all, the, all the systems, every one of them. Um, the uh, central monitoring system from uh, one vendor, uh, if you replay in any of, the pa any of the traffic it had previously seen from the patient monitor, it would fall offline for an indeterminate amount of time. And then uh, we found a, a null pointer dereference in a, um, a stress testing system. It was actually in a, uh, another QRSCP, uh, DICOM port. Uh, it was a third party DICOM library. And um, we found that if we sent this particular string here, I think it's actually the first couple bytes of that that really do it. Um, I think it opens some logic tree in there and it start, wants to accept data and then falls. Um, it was a third party DICOM library. We downloaded the uh, trial, the SDK version of the, of the DICOM library and uh, you know, I'll, I'll read it and debug this because this was actually in like a Windows based system. Um, and we found it to be a null pointer reference. Uh, we didn't, in the time allotted to us, uh, weren't able to uh, actually find any kind of RCA or you know, actually be able to control uh, or, or, or structure, move the input where we want it to be. Um, but we were able to reliably kill the device. All right, so crypto. Um, weak crypto, weird crypto, or home-rolled home crypto schemes are really common. Um, what we find is that instead of using standard crypto implementations, uh, multiple vendors are just doing all kinds of weird stuff. This is the one I just talked about with the patient info packet when we were uh, doing device impersonation, right? Basically, there's a 256-byte array on the sending and receiving system, right? Um, I can't do that with the um, on the sending and receiving system. Um, and then the decimal value of each byte in the packet, so that decimal value is the 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 uh, the offset in the array to look for the unencrypted value, and that's really all it is. So it's just a simple key key. Look at this point in this number and retrieve. And then there was a bit of uh, byte reordering that you can see there as well. But that was the sum total of the encryption being used. Um, this one's even better. Um, so this one was being used to encrypt credentials stored in, in, a, in a config file. Um, those credentials actually granted admin access to a database server with all kinds of uh, PHI and PII on it. Um, so for each ASCII character, in that was uh, that that made up the encrypted value. Uh, picture an ASCII table. So you have the ASCII value, and you have its corresponding decimal value. All right. So ASCII value, decimal value. Um, if the decimal value uh, is less than um, 31, add 224 to it. If it's greater than 251, subtract 224 from it. So you're moving through the array. All right. And then if the decimal value uh, of the ASCII value is Trying to remember. Um, if it was even, decrement it by four. If it's odd, add four. All right, and then you have the value. So that's it. And that is a you know a hard coded um, system, if you will, on all of those devices. So basically, once you you know it, you can do it with a pencil and paper. 
right? Um, which would then allow you to walk into you know any hospital in the world that has this, that particular device and know and be able to decrypt those stored credentials that will then grant you access not to the system that they're on but to the back end database system that has that and way other uh, interesting stuff on it much more interesting stuff yes i can talk um, plain text protocols, this kind of goes without saying, you got stuff all over the place, like, you know, DICOM and HL7, um, SNMB v2 and, uh, XML based HTTP over, over plain text HTTP, uh, also SLIP, which was the first time I'd seen SLIP in many, many years. Um, if you guys remember SLIP, the predecessor to PPP, uh, yeah, we're going back a ways. Um, also, I guess it should be mentioned that the, the, uh, what you find quite often with the um, uh, vendor-supplied servers is that they're also vu vulnerable to tr traditional net pen stuff like LLM and RMBTNS poisoning, so you can pull creds off the network by using those techniques. Um, so another interesting thing here was we had a, th a thick client that, from a, uh, a vendor that communicated with a uh, PAC server, a back-end PAC server. So this was like a thick client. It would switch to, when you, want, when you put in your credentials to authenticate, it would switch to HTTPS. Well, that's great, right? Unfortunately, immediately afterwards, it would switch to HTTP. So the session cookie is going back and forth, back and forth, you know, is going out each time in plain text, right? So what's the, what's, what's the freaking point? Um, the other the interesting thing about that session cookie is we couldn't kill that thing. We logged out properly. You know, we stole it. We're able to log in. Yay. We logged out properly. Still worked. We tried it a month later at the end of the engagement, just for giggles, because the client's like, think that they still think that thing still works? Yep, still worked. Probably still working to these day, I don't know. Um, we didn't bounce the server. That would have been the only one. If it, if it, if it still worked after the server bounced, that would have been something. But um, So at any rate, yeah, the, the case of the cookie, it wouldn't die. Um, all right, so these last two are not medical devices. Uh, so full disclosure. I just want to throw these in because they were kind of cool examples of what hard coding stuff will get you. Um, this was on a network pen test uh, like uh, two years ago. Um, I was doing a pen test. It was an open network share. I found a bunch of these XML files, and uh, in them was a bunch of w w w it was clearly encrypted credentials. You had the username, and then you had an encrypted password value, and you had the domain name. And there was like 30 of these. And um, I'm like, man, that is interesting. So based on the name of the file, I Googled it, and I found what software it was. I pulled down the trial version of the software, reversed the software, and it had a lightly obfuscated, hard-coded key, and we found it was using um, uh, triple des to do the, uh, the encryption. Um, extracted the key, wrote some code to um, uh, what do you call it? To decrypt them, and in, uh, actually, in, in giving uh, credit where credits due, my uh, colleague Brian Wallace worked with this on me. And uh, at any rate, decrypted the credentials. Uh, we got like a bunch of uh, sets of credentials. Not all of them were still good, but one of them was uh, a DA account. Not only was it a DA account, it was a DA account that never expired. Their other DA accounts required you to log in from, from uh, specific systems, although you could just spoof the host name and get around that. This one didn't require that. So it was like the God account, right? And um, yeah, they were, uh, they were surprised about that one. So that's, you know, hard coding your crypto key, not a good idea. Uh, another example of what hard-coded creds will get you. So this was a telematics device I assessed about a year ago, and it communicated over 3G over GSM. <laughs> Um, so it communicated, so uh, we, uh, it, it used a um, uh, bus pirate and flash ROM to dump the, uh, the wind bond SPI uh, uh, flash, it was a SOIC flash 8 pin, dumped that out, used bin walk to extract it, and there's an XML file in it, again, XML files for the win. Um, so I noticed that in there, there was a set of credentials, there was an FTP server uh, IP address, and then there was an APN name. Now an APN name, an access point name, uh, I was un unfamiliar uh, at, uh, up to that point of what that was exactly, but it is a gateway between a cellular network and an other computer network, commonly the internet, but not always. In this case, it was the gateway we found. Uh, basically, what we did was we, we used uh, WV dial in a, in a uh, wireless card, and we hooked up, we put in the APN name, and we found that this was a gateway between the cell provider's network and the vendor's privately addressed RFC 1918 private network. So now we're in there, 
on their private network, and there's a whole mess of systems in there, and we have credentials to this FTP server. So let's go to the FTP server. Go to the FTP server. Log in. In it is all the versions of software for that particular, for that device. Um, and there was config files in there with a whole mess of creds for other servers, other databases, everything else. Now, we were assessing this for third party, so we didn't go any further from there um, because, you know, I didn't want to get in trouble. Um, but that server was the server that the devices, and this is a live device in the field, so this wasn't the only one. It was the server that it used for its over-the-air update. So, and the firmware wasn't signed either. So we could have replaced any of the firmware on that server. Every one of those devices would have now pulled our firmware, installed it, and we would have backdoor on every one of these devices. So that's what hard coding stuff in, in your flash chips gets you. All right, I'm almost on time here, so some quick recommendations. Um, some recommendations for providers, so for hospitals, right? Firstly, dude, inventory your medical devices and assess their attack surface. Know what you have and know what they're speaking over, what their interfaces are. I found that a lot of providers, they don't even, they, they ask just to come in to help them identify what, me, what the inventory of their devices are. They don't even know what they have, uh, let alone what their exposure is. Um, disable any unneeded functionality. If they're not communicate, if you're not using the wireless functionality, disable it, right? Um, same thing with any other interfaces. Segregate medical devices from the general clinical network, or the general hospital network, all right, as much as possible. Um, disable any unused ports, all right, that would allow, uh, physical ports, Ethernet ports, that will allow access to those networks, right? A hospital is pretty much a public area. Uh, you know, you're, you can't really, uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to keep people from being in a patient room and connecting into something unless the port's disabled. Monitor for attack traffic. Uh, and report your findings from your assessments, either internally or from third party, to uh, the device vendors, right? And if you are a larger organization, or even not, put pressure on those vendors, you know, uh, politely, to, you know, remediate this stuff, uh, because enough of that will make a difference. Uh, recommendations for vendors. Assume that attackers will, will buy your device off eBay or wherever and reverse engineer it. Uh, a lot of them, I think, take the tack that, oh, well, you know, these are attacks that they'd have to be in the hospital, they'd have to be on the network. How long would it take them to attack the hardware of that, you know, room in a hospital? No, they're not going to do it like that. They're going to take it home. They're going to buy it. They're going to take their time, learn their, learn their vulnerabilities, devise their attacks, and, devi and, and create something that can be done in short order, like uh, plugging in a USB or an SD card that your device uses for its uh, firmware update and then backdoor the firmware because that's a common uh, mechanism for doing that. Um, use standard crypto algorithms with secure key storage, all right? And use a TPM, a trusted platform module, to do key storage, all right? Store your keys securely and use standard crypto algorithms. Do not roll your own, all right? Cryptography is not easy. Um, don't run your, a your applications uh, um, on the server side under admin or root privileges, okay? Um, run them on the only, obviously, this is, you know, best security practice stuff. Um, Mutual authentication between devices, all right? Have devices ascertain that each other are who they think they are, right? Mutual auth is, is critical in that sort of ecosystem. And finally, as we've seen, don't encrypt credentials, all right? Hash them or use the built-in auth mechanisms. Uh, and that's all I got. So, uh, questions? Questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Honestly, no. Um, so, uh, okay, so most of the stuff that we've done, we either do it for, for, uh, for vendors in-house or we do it for providers. In the case of providers, uh, it is the providers, uh, it's basically up to their prerogative as to if they want to report it, what they want to do. We can't circumvent that process. But the short answer really is no, I have not. Yes. Um, uh, neither built in. Um, DICOM actually does have built in. I think DICOM has the built in ability to use TLS. 
Um, HL7 does not, but can be uh, implement when it in in the implementation can be wrapped wrapped in uh, like a TLS tunnel or use an IP or use IPsec to wrap it or some other tunnel to carry it through. Um, in the case, the difference there is that DICOM it's actually built into the into the standard itself, and I believe it uh, specifies the ability the it has the ability to use TLS, so it's built in as like a as a security profile. Um, but I don't often see that implemented, sadly. Um, generally, it seems like the, the vendors leave it up to the provider, that the hospital, to actually install all components. So you're thinking about, you know, also not just the back-end server, right, doing the communications, but the device itself, that's uh, the imaging device sending uh, images over DICOM to it, would both need to be in a, a secure network, uh, um, so, uh, you know, a secure VLAN, et cetera, right? So uh, HIPAA, I'm not an expert on HIPAA. Um, I'm more of, you know, yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm more of a hands-on guy than a policy guy, as anybody I work with will tell you. But uh, yeah, it wasn't to my knowledge either. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a lead CD for medical device integration for the DOD. Um, so one of the questions I have is we're now being approached with IoT, Internet of Things, Medical devices coming out, got an iPad, doctors want to use it, ER, working with patients, these things integrate with medical devices. What's your approach to security related to those devices and the medical uh, the use of those in the clinical environment? Question. I mean, it's a yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking on that one, then. You know? Um, I mean, you have to look at it as the device itself and then the, the, the rest of the ecosystem, right? Um, I think that you need to limit, you know, the, uh, the, what those devices are able to do, um, just off the top of my head, right? Um, you know, try to lock them down as much as possible so that you don't have, you know, like the same problem that you have in like with ICS systems like HVAC, right? Where, you know, the, the maintenance guys are surfing bad places on the machine that, that, that control the, the, HM, the, uh, the HMI machine for, uh, for the uh, HVAC system, right? And then you wonder why they're full of all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, so the same thing, right? You don't want them, uh, if, it's a, if it's a iPad, for instance, used to interface with uh, one of these systems, right? You don't want them to be able to access the internet on it, do other functions, right? You want to lock that down as much as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would, you know, honestly, if you think about it, probably the, the security model of the iPad is probably a fair bit ahead of that of most medical devices, right? Or other... Yeah. So, yeah, it's a strange world we live in. Uh, back there. Oh, time. Oh, so in, in terms of the actual, um, the actual OSs, um, you just see actually vendors that have their own Linux OS. Uh, I could uh, say one, like uh, GE has uh, Healy OS, which is a, uh, I guess you could say a fork of, of, sub, of scientific Linux. That would be one example. You see a lot of like Windows XP embedded, Windows CE, um, you know, other Linux variants. Um, it's basically all over the place because like such a wide disparate uh, ecosystem of devices, right? Um, and then you have like the RTOS stuff, right? Um, but yeah, it, it varies quite a bit. Yeah, you yeah, see, you see U-boot a lot. Yeah, I mean, so you see stuff like U-boot and BusyBox, and you know everything that you'd, you know, a lot of the stuff that you'd see, you'd see, you know, just in. in I mean, there's not a huge leap between that and the, the rest of the, uh, you know, IoT embedded device world, right? Um, it's really just more the, the purpose that it's put to and some other considerations. Cool. All right, guys, I think I have to get out of here before I get booted off the stage, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs>